Welcome to this Authors in Conversation panel featuring the 2021 Minnesota Book Awards finalists in the competitive middle grade literature category. The Minnesota Book Awards is a program of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library in the organization's capacity as the Minnesota Center for the Book. This year's Book Awards are sponsored by Education Minnesota. Education Minnesota is also generously, specifically sponsoring the middle grade literature category. My name is Kate Allen. I'm the 2020 winner in the middle grade category for The Line Tender. As we get started, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land on which many of us on the panel recording are zooming in from today. This land was reserved for the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. We also acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. The Dakota and Ojibwe people are the original stewards of story in this place now called Minnesota. The Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, organizers of the Minnesota Book Awards, honor this tradition and knowledge and values embedded in it as we work to lift up storytellers in our state. For this installment of the Minnesota Book Awards popular Meet the Finalist series, I am pleased to be joined by Drew Brockington, author of Catstronauts Digital Disaster, published by Little Brown and Company, part of Hachette Book Group. Margie Preuss, author of The Littlest Voyageur, illustrated by Cheryl Pilgrim and published by Margaret Ferguson Books, part of Penguin Random House. Curtis Scaletta, author of Luke Zilla Beats the Game, illustrated by David Sosella and published by Capstone Editions. And Annika Fajardo, author of What If a Fish, published by Simon & Schuster. Congratulations to each of you for the MNBA finalist nod. It's exciting. And I'm really glad to have the opportunity to talk with each of you today. I'd like to ask some questions specific to each of you and your finalist books, and Drew is up first. All right, Drew. You fielded interviews about the Catstronaut series from a host of people, ranging from Carrie Miller on Minnesota Public Radio to a Blue Muppet affiliated with the Austin Public Library. What's the one thing interviewers don't usually ask about the graphic novels that you wish they would? Um. Well, thank you, uh, first of all. Um, and I'll, I'll just preface with um, ever since I rewatched the interview with the Muppet, and now I just want to always talk to Muppets. Um, <laughs> so it was, it's such a fun way to um, to do some interviews. But um, I think a, a lot of the a lot of the focus um, when I, I talk about the books are you know, how much involvement goes into making a graphic novel or, you know, who are they intended for? Um, is it okay for kids to read graphic novels? Um, that type of thing. Um, a, a question that comes up a lot is, you know, why are there not dogs and that type of thing. Um, but one thing that I always wish I could talk more about is the actual science of the books. Um, the Castronauts are very, it's, it's very sci-fi. Um, but it's all rooted in the real world. So I always think of it as a love letter to NASA, where I grew up watching, you know, skipping recess to watch the space shuttle launch in the library of my elementary school. Um, and, you know, it all sparked from there. So every adventure that they go on is always, you know, plausible. It's always has a foot in reality. And I always think of like if, uh, you know, if what the Kestronauts want to do, um, if we, you know, they have no budget constraints and all the theories, you know, scientific theories are correct, then, you know, what would we be able to do in our solar system? And that's kind of what the Kestronauts can do. So in Digital Disaster, it's looking at space tourism and the future of that. Um, the character Darby Fuzzleton is kind of uh, an embodiment or a, a cat embodiment of uh, Richard Branson and his company uh, Vir Virgin Galactic, which is trying to uh, bring, uh, you know, suborbit space tourism to people who can afford the quarter of a million dollar per ticket price tag. Um, but Darby has figured that out and she is, you know, going to open up an fully automated space hotel that you'll be able to 
stay at for you know days on end. So it's always um, in the catch or not books. It's always a question of you know okay, what are we trying to do in our world? And their cats are obviously smarter than us. They've already nailed it, and they're you know on to the next stage. What's the next stage of that space tourism? What's that going to look like? Thanks, Drew. Okay, Curtis, in your book, online gaming comes across clearly as a community affair. With the pandemic and social distancing, a sense of community is something we tend to take less for granted these days. For the benefit of the people who don't game, what do you see as noteworthy and special about the communal aspects of online gameplay? You know, um, uh, I really came to appreciate it myself since the uh, I wrote the book because of the pandemic, because my son doesn't get to see his friends in person, but he plays games with them all day <laughs> uh, if we let him. Uh, you know, uh, so the games that he was playing, this the one in the book is largely based on Fortnite, which was kind of a rage at the time. And but then I mixed in some elements of other games, and I was kind of intrigued by the the way that kids played the game together. But now it's like kind of reached this whole new level of this isn't just something I do with my friends. It's the only way that I really see my friends. And of course he could just get into messenger and like talk to them, but they need something to be doing together. So, um, so he regularly talks to his buddies. Um, and so I like, I almost wish I had right waited for the pandemic to write it because it, well, they wouldn't have been able to have the tournament. So never mind that, but it's, it's, it's even, it's like the importance of that social uh, dynamic is even higher than it was when I wrote it at the time where it was just something kids were doing together. And I kind of wanted to show the positive stuff about games for parents like me, whose kids game all day. Um, and so anyway, I guess that, uh, does that answer your question? Definitely, thank you. Um, Annika. Cameron and Eddie have such a wonderful dynamic. Cameron is bold and self-assured. Eddie's a bit more introspective and has more than his fair share of fish out of water moments in this book. Why did you integrate Cameron into the story? Was she there from the first draft? And can you tell us about the thought process behind the dynamic you created with this pair? Thanks, Kate. That's a great question. I, I, I love that um, Cameron gets a little attention. I did have um, a couple of people who have said, Cameron needs her own book, <laughs> which um, which is like a fun thing to think about. Um, so Cameron is a new student, um, new to the neighborhood. And so Eddie, who has just his best friend has just moved away. So he's kind of lost and she's equally lost. Um, and so she was sort of born out of um, my own daughter. So I, uh, um, I have a daughter and I, of course, um, grew up as a girl, not a, not a 12 year old boy. So I was stretching with the boy um, character. And so it was nice to add in this girl character that I, you know, have a little bit more personal experience with. Um, my daughter longed for purple hair when she was 11, when she was that age, <laughs> which now she's 14. So she does have purple hair now. Um, and so that was part of it. And, and I really wanted there to be a, another, another kid character. I had read an article about Katie Camilla talking about because of Win Dixie and that when she first wrote it, the, there was editors or somebody who had told her, you need to have um, the girl interacting with other kid characters, that all interactions in a children's book has to have the kid, having kid experiences that, like, you know, there's a lot of children's books with really great adult characters, but we, you know, that's interesting to us as the writer. Um, but we want to have, see that like interaction. So she was partly purposefully put there so that he would have this kid interaction, especially since his brother is almost 10 years older than him. So that's not really like a, a peer relationship. Um, and so, and I, and I also want to just kind of just show kind of the opposites of, you know, the typical girl character who is maybe, you know, quieter, maybe more introspective. She's in this, Cameron is the outspoken one. Cameron's kind of the daring one. She makes a lot of bad choices. And then Eddie uh, is kind of the antithesis of typical boy characters. So he's the one who's introspective. He's the one who's very cautious and doesn't want to do stuff. So she kind of pushes him towards 
doing what he needs to do, which was tricky from a writing standpoint because I kept getting told your character has to have agency. And I was letting, letting Cameron like do everything, <laughs> force him into everything. So sometimes she got me into trouble, but, but I think it's important to show like that boys and girls can be all the whole spectrum of, of different of personality. Thanks, Annika. Margie. So the protagonist in The Littlest Voyager is much like those in your previous books, a character living a life of adventure through some historical epic. However, unlike Manjiro in The Heart of the Samurai and Astri in West of the Moon, the main character in this book is a squirrel. Why did you choose to make this jump and focus on an animal character? Thanks, Kate. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm not sure it actually was a jump because I started this story so long ago that um, I don't remember. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I it might, might have been before the, the books you mentioned that I started writing this. Um, and I really don't remember what possessed me, um, except that I do spend a lot of my writing time staring out the window. And out my window, there is a nice little woods. And in that woods are red squirrels. And I am very entertained by their, these angry little acrobats. Um, in the trees. And I, I suppose at one point I thought, you know, what would happen if you got one of those in your canoe? It would be trouble. And trouble's always a good place to start when you're writing. <laughs> um, so that might have been it. Also, they're very red. And, uh, you know, the voyagers were red hats. And um, at the time, I believe they, they paddled with red paddles. Um, I guess that wasn't true. I, one of those many things I found out in my research, um, but, you know, in red sashes and so on. So I thought, well, they would fit right in, you know, with all that, that redness. And uh, well, speaking of Kate D. Camillo, <laughs> since Annika mentioned her, this is how long ago I started writing this, that during its gestation period, Flora and Ulysses came out. And I thought, oh, well, there it is, the definitive squirrel book. I, I better put my my book away. And I did because I thought, well, for one thing, I thought everybody would think I was copying Kate D. Camillo, even though I probably started writing this when she was in elementary school. Um, <laughs> so um, so I, then I took it out, you know, years later and, and started working on it again. And so what happens now the book comes out the same year Florian Ulysses, the movie comes out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, what can you do? <laughs> I think there's room for more than one squirrel out there. <laughs> yeah, I guess. So. <laughs> but those are the things, I mean, come on, you other other writers, don't you think about those things? Like, oh, yes, no, totally. Gonna, I'm, I'm doing the same thing, you know, some other wonderful writer has done and I can't do it as well, so. <laughs> no, you did a beautiful job. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, let's go back to Drew. Okay, cats in space might seem like a wild concept at first, but your foursome of intrepid explorers has a team dynamic, and that's something important to stories of all sorts. Pom Pom, Major Meowser, Waffles, and Blanket each have their own mission roles and talents, as well as special character traits. How did you first develop these fun characters and their special dynamic? Are certain cats easier to write than others? And do you see yourself in any of them? Maybe even in all of them? Um, the easiest character to write is actually Casterbot, the robot helper. Um, because Casterbot is the straight man of the, if like if this was a comedy troupe, Casterbot is always deadpan and always like speaks the truth. So it's it's really just kind of liberating to be like, -r -r -r, I don't have to be, he's, uh, the, the Casterbot becomes like naturally funny because of that, um, which is really fun. But yeah, in figuring out the, the, uh, the original pitch for Castronaut is based off of a mini comic, which it was a 10 page comic and none of the cats had names and, and they all were, you know, astronauts. Um, and that was like the first critique I got from my editor is like, they got to have names, they got to be distinct and, you know, remember that they're a team. So then it was, how do I divide them up? 
um, and and giving them jobs was easy because you know that's part of the, the the astronaut crew. Everyone has their specific jobs, and everyone knows how to do their job and you know fifteen thousand other jobs. Um, but when I got to giving their personalities out, um, it was it was more just kind of looking at um, who I was at a certain point in when I was growing up. So waffles is, you know, before I wanted to be an illustrator, I wanted to be a pilot. So Waffles, you know, I could put all of that like childhood, like this is what I want to be when I grow up. This is my dream job kind of thing into him. And uh, and Waffles also has that kind of same sense of humor as a 12 year old would have sometimes. Like he's always trying to impress his friends by eating huge amounts of things and even impress himself and and that like that uh, and major meowser is kind of like my senior year of high school when i had to you know finish that service project and make sure everything got in on time and get your applications out and really became like that taskmaster of you know um the uh making sure everything was accomplished and orderly and you know we got home safe at the end of the night um and then you know from there like blanket you know as an adult i really got into you know fixing up you know wherever i was living at the time um you know installing new sinks learning how things work and so i got to go down that rabbit hole with him with uh engineering and and reading up some things um and pom pom is uh i've never been good at science so pom pom might be the hardest to write but fortunately my brother uh, actually went on to become uh, an electrical engineer and a rocket scientist. So he, uh, you know, I'm just like, hey, we're in, you know, these cats are in this situation. You know, what what would you do in that situation? So he and I actually have some back and forth about, you know, like, you know, and he'll send me an equation and be like, just put this up on the backboard, on the on the on the chalkboard. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, all right, great. Uh, he's like, you don't, you don't need to know what it means, but it, it's, it's all about like making sure they stay in orbit. And I was like, okay, Sam. Okay. So um, it's been really fun to kind of uh, revisit those parts of me and then kind of see where the characters expand and take them. Um, so, yeah. Thanks so much. Um, Curtis. So your character, um, the retired librarian, Isaac, he's one of the most colorful characters in Lukezilla Beats the Game. Was he modeled after anyone? Are there any seniors who influenced you profoundly when you were young as Isaac did Luke? Uh, what about a grandparent or another senior? Um, I love this question, but the answer is that no. <laughs> um, and I love it because I was a kid, I did this senior sitting uh, kind of thing, activity and it was there was a woman across the street and I would go do jigsaw puzzles with her and stuff but Isaac is nothing like her it's just that I had always thought oh that would be a good uh, that would be a good children's book uh, premise like the, the kid and it's one of those things that I had kind of poked at in various ways over the years and so finally this book saw like a perfect bit of that premise with another plot line because you know uh, his parents make him do some volunteer work over the summer in exchange for not hassling him about spending the rest of his waking hours playing games and so uh and so he's a senior sitter he befriends this um older man and then he uh witnesses uh isaac having a medical emergency big spoiler there for those who haven't read it but but then that tied in perfectly another component of this book is like the whole gaming community. I saw some positive stuff, but there's also some kind of some negative stuff, especially through like the YouTube kind of stuff. Uh, you know, these sassy guys that kind of it's there's it, it's it's just heavy bro kind of <laughs> talk. And I heard my son watching some of this, and I love Dan TDM, and I would be like, can you watch Dan some more? Because some of these other guys are kind of jerks. <laughs> and so um, and so I, I it, but that set up the perfect plot for uh, the, the uh, more spoilers, but uh, talking about it, the, the um, insensitivities and stuff, I, I found mm -hmm. kind of a way to, for Luke to address that because of his connection to Isaac, he feels more, uh, you know, outraged. And so that was an important character transformation is that he's going to now stand up 
know, for what he believes in, which is just being a friend to his buddy Isaac. And so, and then I enjoyed creating Isaac as a character because like, just like they're very similar in a lot of ways. Like Isaac was into mystery books and his mom didn't approve. So he kind of gets where Lucas is from and come. And then Luke finds out that as a much younger man, Isaac was actually a tech pro and an innovator. He had kind of made all these assumptions about him that, that weren't accurate. So. So I had a lot of fun creating the character as kind of both a parallel to uh, Lucas, but also having Lucas learn more about the world through him. So anyway, yeah, I love that relationship in the book. It's definitely the heart of the book. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely a sucker for multi-generational characters, for sure. Um, Annika, so water is a central motif um, throughout What If a Fish. It's hard to pinpoint all the many ways in which it's important. Can you sketch out the roles that you wanted water to play, including any that are under the surface? The, the amount of um, puns that I have heard, um, you earlier, Kate, said that he was a fish out of water, which we, my editor and my agent kept referring to those, all these, and you know, what's below the surface. And, still waters run deep, um, you know, I mean, we were just, it was like constant um, uh, uh, puns and, and, and sayings like that. Um, so, I mean, I think that the reason we have those sayings is because water is just so powerful, you know, it, these, these things come from somewhere. And I, so I was born in Colombia, but I was born in the mountains um, and, you know, totally landlocked. And then I grew up in Minnesota, totally landlocked. And the first time I saw the ocean, I just felt like I had this like religious experience. I just, it was like the most fabulous thing I'd ever seen. And I, and I just felt myself drawn to it. And I kind of thought about that when I first had that reaction to the ocean and then thought about growing up around all these lakes and that we, not just the lakes, but also, um, this he references this a little bit in the book is that feeling of the endless prairie being kind of an echo also of the endlessness of the ocean and so i don't know if when i first saw the ocean if i was had sensing something like that but i think like when you are in when you're from minnesota you when that's your experience you have the open spaces is land right and then you have water um and i wanted to really kind of pull out that kind of the feeling of how important water is and how important lakes are to people living in Minnesota. And, and then I used Cartagena because when I, when I went to Cartagena and visited um, with my family there, again, you know, this beautiful ocean and um, these, and I was watching my kid and my nephew have the experience of, of being in this ocean space and in this, and not just the ocean, but also this culture that they were not used to. Um, and so partly I wanted to kind of reflect on that. Um, and, and the amount of metaphors that you can play with when you have that much water is really fun because basically everything can then become this metaphor. And, and, and I don't know which came first exactly because there's a lot of Eddie that is, you know, there is a lot going on underneath that people don't see in him right away. And I think that's true a lot for kids who are coming from mixed backgrounds or who are minorities and on, you know, in an all white um, situation where they have things that other people can't see when they first look at them. And so, you know, that idea of, you know, there might be this gigantic scary fish under the water, or it might be the prize winning fish, you know, it might be something wonderful, or it might be, you know, the beautiful tropical fish under there. And so you don't know. And so, and so it was a really fun thing to play with and kind of go back and forth. And, and when I first saw your book, Kate, um, last year, when I saw the, the cover, I was like, oh, that's just makes me feel so good to see those, those sea creatures. <laughs> I know that's where my heart lives for sure. Thank you so much, Annika. Okay, Margie. What kind of research did you do to get into the mindset and flesh out the lives of the French Canadian fur traders that our intrepid hero Jean Pierre Petit Le Rouge travels alongside? And did you do any research on the indigenous peoples with which they trade? Um, yeah, you wouldn't think that you'd need to do so much research if your protagonist is a squirrel. But um, <laughs> I actually ended up joking with one of my very 
very, very good resources. Stephen Veit from the Grand Portage National Monument, who, uh, who I don't know what his title is, but it should be the guy who knows everything about voyageurs. Um, he, he and I joked that the littlest voyageur was going to be the definitive scholarly work on voyageurs by the time I was done because <laughs> I kept asking him so many questions. And, um, and I had an editor who was very exacting. She wanted every thing to be right and correct, which again, you wouldn't expect when you have a, a squirrel protagonist, but, um, but the information about the voyageurs is, is quite accurate. Um, so yes, I did do a lot of research and, uh, and also I did want to say that not only were the people with whom the uh, voyagers traded indigenous, but the voyagers themselves were often indigenous or of uh, First Nations and um, French Canadian parentage. Um, and really without the indigenous people, the fur trade would not have been possible. They built the canoes, which they had been paddling around trading themselves in for, you know, who knows how, how many centuries before. Um, so they built the canoes, they paddled the canoes, they trapped the furs, and they kept the white traders alive during the harsh winters um, and probably other times as well. Um, and, and the fur trade was really a beneficial, it was beneficial for both sides. And um, I actually, in, I, that's one of the things I liked uh, to be able to shed a little light on a time during history when um, people got along. The, these people got along. The, the European and the indigenous people um, found a way of working together and um, to the benefit of both, at least for a time. And um, they wouldn't have been able to foresee a time when um, white Europeans moved into that land and wanted it for themselves. So it was a it was kind of a little moment in time separate from from what we think of uh, in in terms of like the European influence in in the Americas. At least in this part of the world, uh, that's the way it was. So yes, I did a lot of research and, and as long as I'm um, giving shout outs, I'd also give a shout out to Linda Lagarde Grover, um, who, who was also a good resource for me. And then many, you know, books. And um, I, I looked at the images of Frances Ann Hopkins, who is the one, when you see pictures of voyageurs, a lot of times they're her paintings. And, uh, and I got so interested in her, I started delving into her lifetime and thinking, why don't you make a good subject for a book too, you know, um, traveling in those times, uh, the only woman in uh, among these very hardy, rough and tumble um, voyageurs, and she loved the life. Thank you so much. Thanks to our tremendous middle grade category finalists and to you all watching for taking part in this Meet the Finalist panel. If you enjoyed this talk, you can find a treasure trove of past events archived on the YouTube channel of the Minnesota Book Awards Steward Organization, the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. You can find out about more programs on their website, thefriends.org. In particular, mark your calendars for Thursday, April 29th. That's the evening that the winner in this literary category and eight others are finally revealed. It will be entirely online. Attendance is free, but registration is required. Visit thefriends.org slash MNBA to reserve your spot. Thank you all for participating. Stay well.